Good evening. Good to see uh, some familiar faces, new faces. Uh, we've been walking through a series, really trying to make sure we know who uh, God is, because that is the core of uh, making sure we, we have uh, the proper foundation for answering questions. Uh, the first week was, was an overview of just how we understand who the Trinity is as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, last week was how God saves us, and therefore how I, that allows us to pray the way Jesus taught in his name to the Father. Um, today, we're, we are, tonight, we are asking a, a specific question, but it's driving at uh, a, 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 an important truth. Uh, the question is, what kinds of uh, decisions does God give us uh, his will for? How, how, how do we know God's will for difficult decisions? So, I want to, to hear from you all, what kind of decisions are difficult that you're, you're wanting to know God's will for? It's not a rhetorical question. What kinds of questions do you say, if, if I knew this, God, I wish you would tell me this. Nobody has any curiosity. Wisdom, okay. What job to take? Where what? Where to live? Yeah, at some point, what should you? Where should you go? Should you go to school? What? What should you study? What kind of uh, direction? These, these things seem like very significant directional decisions. Uh, there's a way in which we can ask God, I want to know your will, and it, there, there, there may be a want to know specifics regarding his will, but there's another way in which God gives us what we need to know. And, and so what we're going to look at is how God reveals himself very fully, very clearly, and how that really is a foundation for us to know what his will is. Um, I might need a black marker because I'm I think I'm probably going to throw this one. Let's see. Ah, wow, that really shows up well. So, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then we go back through the Son, through the Holy Spirit, uh, in, to, uh, through the Son to the Father. So, so this is how we think about the Trinity. Uh, the Father has sent His Son. The Father and the Son have sent their Spirit. The Spirit resides where? And dwells the believer. Where is the Son now? At the right hand of the Father. Uh, God's actions for us are coming to us in this fashion. The Father, Son, Spirit. And we actually go back up to God in the same way. So the Father adopted us. The Son shared his inheritance. The Holy Spirit sealed that uh, uh, adoption and allows us to cry out, Abba, Father, in the name of the Son. Uh, today, tonight, we're actually be looking at how God reveals so that we can have confidence in, in the way we uh, seek wisdom, seek knowledge, seek to be obedient. Uh, there's less of an outline. I think that's because I'm, I'm feeling like very anti-outline tonight, today. Uh, that's the theme from, from this morning. Uh, you have a few texts there, and we're going to spend most of our time in the Second Peter passage. Um, uh, we do have a book giveaway, and this goes along with for the pure, all things are pure. This is all. Uh, there, there's a sense of just worship, uh, recognizing God's mighty, why it matters for everything we think, say, and do by Paul Tripp. It's a, kind of a devotional in the way you think, even the mundane, it's an opportunity for worship. Raise your hand if you, 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 you would read this before everyone else would if, if you got it tonight. I saw Van's hand first. You were, you were just slightly, slightly slow. Van here, get it later. All right, uh, I want to ask you guys some, some, some questions. Just they're, they're Trinitarian by nature. Who can share where the Father tells us who the Son is? Where, what, what places in Scripture uh, are where the Father actually are telling us, people, believers, who the Son is? The Transfiguration, how so? Yeah. 
Yes, all right, so, and, and that goes with the baptism as well, same, two, two, two significant events, uh, the son is either coming up out of the water in baptism, the Holy Spirit descending, or he's transfigured into his glory, and the father says, this is my son, that's a significant moment, okay, another one? Very important, for, important moment in Matthew 16, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And the disciples say, or Peter says, you're the Christ. And Jesus immediately says, you do not know this from flesh and blood, but my Father has revealed it to you. So, so there, there, there's, a, there's a significant point in which, uh, like the Titus passage from the very first week, we never want to see the Father as distant. He is actively revealing. Hebrews 1 tells us that the Father in many times and many ways in previous years had, had spoken through prophets, but now he sent his Son, and it's a fuller revelation because it's an exact revelation. The Father is revealing Jesus as his Son. Uh, passages where we see the Son making known the Father. The Father makes Jesus known as his Son. How does the Son make the Father known? Where does the Son say he makes the Father known? John 14, Philip asks, can we see the Father? Jesus seems frustrated. Have you been with me for so long? When you see me, you see the Father. Uh, John 1.18 opens up, and it's, it, there's, a, there's a grand declaration there. No one has ever seen God. But the only begotten Son who has come from the Father's bosom. That's confusing language, isn't it? Fathers don't have bosoms. He's using language to help us see the Father who has sent his Son. The one closest to him, the eternally generated Son, he's made him known. The Son, as Hebrews 1 also says, has perfectly made the Father known. Um... Where do we see the Holy Spirit making God known? We're actually going to land here because it's pretty easy to recognize the Father makes the Son known, the Son makes the Father known. The Holy Spirit who indwells us, we need to hang out here because this is where revelation is is clearest and most personal. It's where we are. Pentecost, there's a way in which the Holy Spirit comes down and finally lets the disciples' eyes be opened to see uh, all the truths. Now, they had also seen Jesus risen, so there was, there was uh, already some uh, opportunity there. Uh, turn to your Bibles. I didn't print out all the passages because I, 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 be, there's a lot of text I want to cover. John 16. John 14 to 16 is called what? What do we normally call this? John 14, 16 is a significant section of John's gospel. Yeah, the final discourse. So, so these are the last words. John 12 to 20 are one week. 14 to 16 are the last instructions he gives his disciples before uh, dying. These are significant last moments. And John 16, if we go to the, again, these numbers are not always helpful, 4B. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. I, I haven't been able to tell you everything. But now I'm going to him who sent me. Who is that? And none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. They're they're afraid of losing the Messiah because they wanted a powerful Messiah who was going to overthrow the Roman government. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Okay, this is a nice moment. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Who's the helper? All right, so let's just take in for a moment what Jesus just said to his disciples. I need to go away. And it's not I need to die on the cross. I need to rise again so that you can be forgiven, so that you can have new life. It's not that I can be at the right hand of the Father. It's so that I can send to you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's indwelling work is new to New Testament believers after the ascension. 
and Jesus is saying this, it's better that I don't walk alongside of you. It's better that the Holy Spirit resides inside of you. Remember last week we talked about how being in Christ is better than being Adam, in Adam before uh, the fall? Well, here, having the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus' own words, is better than walking alongside of Jesus. And we can kind of see that's obvious because the disciples don't really seem to ever get it until they actually have their eyes open. But but it's significant here that the helper, the the paraclete, the one that the Father will send through the Son, the the, the one the Son sends from the Father, he's going to come and he's going to convict the world of sin and judgment and righteousness. Um, he's, He's called here the Spirit of Truth, verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. They haven't even gotten what he said. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take away, take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. It's an important principle where we've kind of like been, been tiptoeing around, but there's a Father, there's a Son, there's a Holy Spirit. We, we saw how adoption was a one action that requires all three, right? I hope we saw that. I tried to present that. Revelation is an action that takes, involves all three, and there's not different revelations. There, there's not the Father revealing some things over here through the Holy Spirit. And some things over there through the Son. The, the one God who has one will is revealing the one truth. The truth of the Father is the truth of the Son, which is the truth of the Spirit. Now this is important because there's, there's, going, there, there, there's been, throughout history, we talked about you know, those who contradict sound doctrine, who have tried to insist somehow there's special spiritual knowledge that is different than the Son's knowledge and different than the Bible knowledge. There's one God who has one truth, who has one will, and they're all working together. I've got to erase this because it's just contrary to sound doctrine. One will, one truth, one revelation. The Father speaks, the Son is the fullest revelation. We still don't get it. The Holy Spirit actually has to come and indwell us so we'll get it. It's to our advantage that we're not walking with Jesus right now. To your advantage that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and the Holy Spirit is in your soul, in your heart, indwelling you. And we'll see why here in a moment. Questions or comments so far? Oh, yes. I should probably look up when I ask for questions. I thought they would, I thought they'd be right there. I don't know why. That's a glorious opportunity to say, I'm not quite sure. Uh, Hebrews 1 makes it very clear that the Father was speaking through prophets. Now the Father has sent his Son, and he's the fullest revelation. Jesus in the flesh was the fullest revelation of God. It's obviously significantly better and different than the Old Testament. When Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit on, on the disciples... Uh, when the Holy Spirit comes, he, there's obviously something new because I believe it's John 14, 26, he will indwell you forever. So David, he had the Holy Spirit, and he, he, he prayed, take not the Holy Spirit from me. I think that's an anointing Holy Spirit. That's not the sealing and not the, the, the ever-present indwelling Holy Spirit that's going to, to reveal to us the mysteries that the Old Testament saints wanted. So whatever it is, the Father, uh, this is Ephesians 3 that we studied Wednesday. Ephesians 3 says the Father had numerous mysteries that were not yet revealed, but now that Christ has come and the Holy Spirit has unraveled them or or demonstrated them, the the fullness 
So at least in the New Testament, there's a fullness of the revelation. We don't live in mystery anymore. Well, when Jesus is coming back, that's the one mystery we have. I have we have charts for that, though. Um, the Father uh, is sending his Son so that we now know how he's accomplished salvation. Because that is the dilemma in the Old Testament. How is this God who keeps forgiving people going to be just? That's actually the dilemma. How can he be just when he keeps forgiving people who should be uh, condemned? The Holy Spirit comes, and that's clearly new. And this is where my dilemma is. I believe David was regenerated. I believe you're only regenerated by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wasn't absent in the Old Testament. He's just clearly present in New Testament believers in a whole new, intimate, powerful way. Ben. I think absolutely, because we know creation was from the Father through the Son. That's in Hebrews 1 and 1 Corinthians 8, 6, or 6, 8. Dyslexia may have just kicked in there. Um, uh, all things are from the Father and through the Son. Is that 8, 6, or 6, 8? We don't know. It's one of those two. Um, so, so the very act of creation was Trinitarian. Genesis 1, 1 to 3, you wouldn't see it until you have Jesus risen, but we now see that the Father spoke, the Word is the means by which he created all things, and the Holy Spirit's hovering. So you have the whole Trinity right there in Genesis 1-3. You just don't know it's obvious yet until Jesus rises, or Jesus comes and says, I'm the Son of the Father. He was always acting this way, but yeah, it's much more mysterious as to, um, one of my, my favorite 4th century theologians, the Father is clear in the Old Testament, the Son is alluded to. In the New Testament, the time of Jesus, the Son and the Father are clear and the Holy Spirit's alluded to. In the time of the church, which is our time, the Holy Spirit is also clear. So you see progressive revelations revealing more of who God is, but it doesn't mean he's any different or wasn't acting that way in the past. Thanks for clarifying the question. Yeah, one day we hope to all get the same theology lesson on Emmaus Road where Jesus can explain how all of the prophets and psalms and, and are, 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 are all pointing to him. Every, every promise is yes and amen in him. Um, so, excellent. Other questions? I'll look up this time. The, the key here is he's a revealing God. He's not mute. He's not deaf. He's a revealing God. He works to make himself known, and he's very effective in making himself known. Jesus keeps speaking to the disciples, and they keep not getting it. That's what he says. It's to your advantage that the Holy Spirit, he comes to you, because the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, he's, meant to, he's, he's described that way numerous times. He's going to come, and he's not going to speak on his own authority. He's going to speak on the authority of the Son. He's going to speak from the Father. He's going to declare the same truth and it's going to help you be more effective in actually hearing it because of the Spirit's work. There's two ways in which the Holy Spirit is very significant in Revelation. Uh, whatever side of the page you're looking at, 2 Peter 1 is significant as we think about the Holy Spirit's role in Revelation. Let's look at 2 Peter 1, uh, just verses uh, 3 and 4 to begin. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. 
just begin there with that, that first sentence, the first line actually. His divine power has granted what? All things regarding what? Yeah, it's not government and, 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 and uh, navigational skills. Life and godliness. All right? And, and then he's going to go through a number of ways in which we should know how to be adding on to these things in, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to drop down to verse 16. Peter, in verses 12 to 15, he, he, he makes it clear, I know I'm about to die, and this is a, a dying man's last words to a church that he wants to die for, he's willing to die for. He, he, he's, he's, he, he loves the church, and he wants to give the last words. So this is, this is uh, the equivalent of Second Timothy for Peter. For we do not follow cleverly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Uh, what did Peter just do with myth and eyewitness? They're contrasted. There's a but. Just good grammatical analysis. Good job, Nate. Which one is more significant, eyewitness or cleverly devised myths? Yeah, the, a myth, that, that, that's a, as we talked about uh, in Titus, right? They, they follow Jewish myths. They, they follow made-up stories. They, made, they, they follow uh, narratives and, and ideas that are, that are clever. They're enticing, but they were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So, so we're comparing and contrasting. What's better, myth or eyewitness? Good job. 4, verse 17, when we received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from the heavens, for we were with him on the holy mountain. What did he just reference there? The transfiguration. Where the Father, as Nate already started the whole study out, is, is where the Father reveals the Son. The Son is revealed in all of his glory. This is one of the greatest moments of revelation in history. Right? Uh, the, the Old Testament equivalent to, to Sinai. Here, God himself is, is on the mountain uh, only a few disciples got to go up. They heard the very voice of God. They saw Jesus in his glory. This is the moment of moments. Right? If, if we could be anywhere at any time, if we had a, a time capsule, this is where we, or a time machine, this is one of those places like, I'd want to go see this. This is the experience. All right? So, so the eyewitness experience is greater than myth. Verse 19. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. More fully confirmed or more fully sure than what? Okay, so, so we go myth is less than, is that right? Eyewitness experience. Eyewitness experience is less than Word of God, the prophetic word of God. He, he's, he's making clear here the Old Testament text. That's all he's referring to. The, the, the 39 books of the Old Testament canon are more fully confirmed than what we saw and what we heard which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This experience was a God-given experience. This experience, this eyewitness experience, was God-ordained. They were, there was only... 
uh, the, the, the closest disciples, not even the 12, were invited up on the mountain to hear the very voice of God, to see the glory of God. It, it, it's not just like most of our experiences. This is a God-ordained experience, and the highest, one of the highest God-ordained experiences. And Peter, wanting to give full confidence to the church, because what they need is confidence as they're going to move forward in persecution, you have something more fully assured than our own eyewitness experience. You have the prophetic word that is more sure, more confirmed. It's more confirmed, why? What does it mean that they were, that, that they were produced by men carried along by the Holy Spirit? Verse 21. It says, they are not produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Whose will is revealed in Scripture? It's God's will. Now, this isn't a dictation. We see Peter's personality and Paul's personality. We see there's a human author, but the ultimate producer of the words of Scripture are the Holy Spirit. And so we, we, the question about the, the revelation of God, it's the Holy Spirit who is carrying these men along to actually produce the words of the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was not inactive. So, so here, the very words of Scripture are what he's going to give us as the most sure foundation, the most sure and sufficient uh, source of, of all you need to know in order to persevere. Now let's just back up one more moment. Verse 20. Knowing that, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. What's the difference between an event and an interpretation? Yeah, an event happens. But we have to interpret it. Right. In our day and age, we see events happening on TV, and, and it's up to the news networks to put a narrative on them to give you an interpretation of them. We see how powerful interpretations of events are right now on, on both sides. An event is powerful only in as much as we interpret it properly. Jesus Christ was a man who died on a cross between thieves Okay, the fact that it's God's son makes that event significant throughout the history of the world, but, but it's, it's meaningful and impactful for us because God didn't just send his son to down the cross. He gave us the interpretation of what that means. God is not in, just in control of what happens. He's in control of the interpretation of it. He is his own interpreter. If you were having to play a guessing game as to what it means that Jesus died on the cross between two thieves, like it, would, it, would be, it'd be horrible. But we know from Titus, right? He, he ransomed us with his own blood. He, he purchased the church with his own blood. He, he was that sacrificial lamb that takes away our sins. He washes us with that death. So it's the interpretation and the event that we all have because the Holy Spirit has produced for us words. There's a confidence that the will of God, everything we need to know for life and godliness, is revealed by God himself. Questions or comments about that? quoting a hymn there, but yeah, it's just right here in verse 20. So, uh, what's the hymn? God moves in mysterious ways? Yeah, that's, that's worth learning. Um, so, th the events are important. 
There was a whole movement uh, from, uh, from, from 1900, 1960, and it moved on today. It's called neo-orthodoxy. And they, they taught, we don't need the events to happen. We just need to, to have the stories. That's heresy. They, they would literally say, if the bones of Jesus Christ were found, well, he's still resurrected in my heart. No, you, you have to have the event. It's what God did. It's just we don't have just what God did. We have what it means, right? If you want to know the song for that, it's he walks with me and he talks with me. That's like the classic. It's a wonderful song. It sounds fun, but it's, it's actually the New Orthodox song. He, he doesn't have to be dead and risen, die, having, having died and risen. No, he, he, as long as he's in my heart. So, so here we, we see how clear God speaks. He's given us the events, the experiences. He's given us his own interpretation, but we're still not complete yet as to how good of a communicator God is. We need to go to 1 Corinthians 2. Um, what we just talked about in, in 2 Peter, that is the doctrine of inspiration. First Corinthians two six. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age, who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, as it is written. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? He's making an analogy there for us. Who really knows your thoughts? And let's just be honest, we're, we praise God, everyone doesn't know our thoughts. The Spirit of God knows God's thoughts. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Verse 12, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. The Father has sent his Spirit who knows the one thoughts of God, the one truth of God, or the one will of God, so that we would what? Understand the, the things freely given to us by God. What we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths of those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are followed to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but he himself to be judged by no one. For who understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. There's a number of different parts of uh, communication. There's the actual words you use. All right? That is a gray chair. Those were words put into a sentence. There's the intent of those words. My desire was to know, for you to know that that is a gray chair. Then there's the effect of those words. You all now know. Well, see, it wasn't effective. <laughs> we think about these three aspects. This is just communication. How, how often are we able to use the right words to actually communicate what we intend? How often do we wish we had the ability to make sure we put the just the right words in just the right sentence so that we could actually communicate what we intend. How often do we wish we had the words and the intent we have and actually be able to make sure that they fall on the person that we're communicating with in the effective way? How often are we constantly wishing, man, as that came out of my mouth, I just knew I was in trouble? Isaiah 55, 11. My word 
does not return void. God is in complete control of the words that are used. God is in complete control of the words and what he intends to communicate with them. And he's in complete control of the effect. He has given us his words, and he's given us the the very spirit that carried along men to produce these words is now inside of you so that you don't need a special decoder ring. You don't need to look over it with reason, and, and, and only reason, only your judgment. No, you actually have the Holy Spirit that illuminates your very mind to know the thoughts of God that he's already revealed. He wants to be made known. He is able to make himself known. Here, it's not only has he given us the prophetic word more fully sure, he's given us the Holy Spirit so that we can understand. Again, this isn't, he talks about secret knowledge. Now, the secret knowledge has not been revealed. The New Testament is revealing mystery. That revealing mystery is understood by those who are spiritual, not because there's some kind of secret weird grammar in the New Testament, because we suppress the truth with our sin. Questions, comments? There's a full power of God. The Father sends his Son to fully reveal him. The Father and the Son have sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who's given us the words now indwells in us so that we can know God's thoughts. Yes, Katie. Seven minutes, Katie. I mean, my word. Okay, so Katie just wanted to deal with the problem of evil, the problem of election, and the problem of revelation all at once. Ready, go. All right. Um, you, you, you said a number of assumptions, right? You, a, number, a number of things, right? So if God can do what he wants, that's what omnipotence means. I do what I want. If God wants everyone to be saved, I think your word was frustrating. It's frustrating that that doesn't happen. Is that, is that an accurate summary of what you just said? I'm supposed to repeat what you say. It seems like it's frustrating his purpose, his yeah. that, it, that intention can translate into the effect. Yeah, so you're, you're citing there actually a statement on God's will, right? First Timothy 2. It is the will of God that every, that, that all men be saved. Um, so without getting into this too much, uh, he just asked that kings be prayed for. Well, kings are the ones who are persecuting the church. All could be every single person there. It could be all kinds of people, even the authorities that rage against the sun. I'm just not convinced that God has decided, if God wills for all people to be saved, all people will be saved. If God wills something, it will be done. The, the question is how clear it is that God, who's made us in his image, would want us to be saved, would want us to be known by him. There's a, there, we'll talk about the love of God in another session, actually, the, the different loves of God. Um, I think there's a big assumption that I, I don't believe that, it's, that his desire and, 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 and uh, plan of salvation is frustrated. I believe it's, it's, it's presented in scripture as perfect. Those whom he foreknown, he justified. Those whom he justified, he sanctified. Those whom he sanctified, he glorified. That is the golden chain of everything from the beginning to the end of salvation. Um, yeah, that's how I answer that really quick. That should leave you with way more difficult questions. Other questions, other than Katie. Okay, that's a great question. The, the, the confidence here is that we can know. Yeah, the, the words are what God has intended for all people at all times to receive, believe, and know. Now, we also know that the very event of the Mount of Transfiguration, it was recorded for us by the Holy Spirit as he carried along men. And so it's still a truth that we must affirm, not because we experienced it, but because God wrote it for us as a church to 
remember and, and know who Christ is, the glorious one who, who, who appeared in his glory before being sent to the cross. We're a book religion. It's actually that simple. But it's not just a book religion. It's a book religion produced by the Spirit, and that very same Spirit indwells your heart so that you can approach his word with absolute confidence, asking, help me know you more. Yep, Nate. transition. If you go to this other side of your sheet, uh, these are passages that talk about the will of God. We see the first Timothy 2, 3. This is the will of God. He desires all people to be saved. There's another passage. You should Google it. I didn't put it. I couldn't put them all in here. This pleases God Bible. There's, something, there, there's a way in which he, he declares numerous things that pleases him. That, that also is another way of saying his will. But look at Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is. There's a promise here that you may be able to discern what the will of God is as you are transformed in your mind, that you will be able to discern what the will of God is, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. As we're wrestling with these significant decisions, you have options. You can lay out golden fleece. You can lay out, lay out your, your fleeces, right? You can, you can kind of test God, and that's not the whole point. That's not the point of the story. I think it's actually don't do that is the point of the story. It's one of the points of the story. Um, you could do the Bible code. Anybody know what the Bible code is? Remember that, Pat? There, there was a guy who made millions on a book that, that pretended that you could kind of type in your name, and, and, and somebody, there was a code where you, the Bible, they would find like in the Old Testament, like your initials or your, your name in, in consonants, because that's what the, Bible, the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew is written in, and then it would have like accountant in another way. And, and they would create this system, and it would be like, oh, well, my name's Bill, and I'm going to be the president of Cuba one day. And, and it was this, we bought it, because we were longing to have like this certainty that somehow I am in God's book. Well, no, the Holy Spirit's in you. The Holy Spirit's in you to transform your mind so that when you have to make those decisions, all right, where you go to school, what you're going to study, what job you're going to take, where you're going to live, who you're going to marry, those are all big decisions. And, 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 and my, 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 my focus here would want to say, the will of God is for you to be sanctified. The will of God is to love him, and, and as much as you're trying to love him in the way you're making those decisions, not greedy for gain, uh, not, not trying to store up treasures, right? There's, there's boundaries God gives, but as much as we're trying to make those decisions and the will of God, as much as he's revealed his will, which is that we would put off sin, we'd be trained to renounce godliness, we would long to, to, to be purified of our sin. If we seek first the kingdom of God, then I don't know if you can make a wrong decision in what kind of career you take. Uh, wherever you move, the great thing about God is he's not a territorial God. He's the Lord of all the earth. Wherever you go, God is with you. Now, at the same time, you know, there, there is Jonah. We have those different stories. But he's clearly rebelling against God. He's doing what God said not to do. He's not doing what God said to do. And so, so this is where what has God revealed, well, that's what we really need to know. And there's a way in which I just want to give you kind of some peace, I think, and I'd love for Pat to share here. There's a way in which if you are loving God and, and, and pursuing these difficult decisions in a pursuit to love God, I don't think you can make the wrong decision. That's nodding yes. That's encouraging. Yeah. Or you can type your name to the Bible code and see what happens. Thank you. 
scripture, but thinking about Paul when he asked the Lord several times for the thorn in his flesh to be removed. And it was through asking the Lord that it was revealed to him that it was that, that it was for his sanctification. It was so that he would not become prideful. Um, yeah, and something Van mentioned from the beginning, you asked for wisdom. Right? You 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 uh your you're the will of God you want is wisdom. Whenever you're in a trial of whatever it is of various kinds, it doesn't say pray that you'd remove it. It says you have wisdom to persevere through it. And so there is a way in which wisdom gives you the endurance and, and the application of what God has given us so that you actually live in that trial and praise God in the trial. Uh, what, what James commands there is like the most counterintuitive thing ever, uh, at least for me. I'm thinking, God, I want to pray for the trial to leave. And he's like, no, you pray for the trial to have its proper effect. Yeah, I, I don't want to be flippant about these major decisions, but there is a way in which if we're anxious about knowing we have to know exactly what God wants us to do, we're, we're actually just not, we're, we're trying to walk by sight, not by faith. There's a way in which we just know, okay, if, if God has given us friends who say this is, a, this is good, it's not just you. If God has given you a, a heart that says, all right, I know I can love God if I make this decision. Um, I, 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 I'm concerned about the person who's, fearful of being in sin because of a decision like that. Um, I don't think we can make a decision like that unless it's choosing it for sin that, that, would, that would cause us to, to fall so far of the will of God we, we, we would be disciplined. Yeah. Ben? I was going to say, I think maybe the flip side too is sometimes we are just looking for a shortcut. Like, answer this one question in my life. But I think the reality is if we're not like doing the daily, we don't have the daily discipline of like being committed to our local church, being in the word of God, being in prayer, uh, being immersing our mind in all the truth that God's revealed, well, we're going to make bad decisions. Like there's, there's not a shortcut to say, I'm, I'm going to avoid that. And then somehow I'm going to, you know, do this Bible code thing and boom, God's going to tell me the right thing to do. Like, Let's not ever mention Bible code again. <laughs> <laughs> gotten way too much press already tonight. I apologize. Yeah, I mean, there's a way, way my, my, yeah, as I look at myself, like, there's, a, there's a way in which we're practicing pagans, right? We, we go to the idol, and we, we want to say, God, I'll, I'll do this if you'll just give me that. You know, I want to barter with God. If you'll just make this one thing clear, God, all along, I said, I've just asked you to believe in my son and obey my commandments. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't need your sacrifice. I need your obedience. Uh, it's not just a great Keith Green song. That's actually scripture. Um, there, there, there's a way in which I, I think we, we want to take these big, heavy things that feel heavy, and we're actually making idols of our own lives rather than saying, all right, God has saved me. He's purchased me. Now what is his will? Well, First Colossians 1.9, Paul prays, asking that may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. You can be filled with the knowledge of his will so that you might actually walk in a way fully pleasing to him. Do whatever job you want, and you're a worshiper. Uh, you did mention something earlier that's interesting, though, that if you're thinking about where you're going to move next, we would think, all right, you know, what kind of health care system, what kind of job, what kind of housing do we think, is there actually a healthy church? Because a Christian, are we going to think, are we going to prioritize them? Is there a place where I know I'm going to thrive as a Christian? I, I, I hope that's actually a decision people, you know, uh, part of the equation. I don't think it is a lot. So now that you're completely dissatisfied, that I'm not going to tell you how to know exactly what the will of God is for a decision. Any complaints? It's actually freedom. You don't have to live in a burden that if I make the wrong, if I if I take the wrong job, I'll, I'll, God will never be happy with me again. No. I, the covenant of marriage, that, that's significant. That, that, that's Lord willing and should be like a one-time thing. And, and, and as you're, you're anxious about that, right, there's one which, all right, if I'm loving God with all my heart and what's most attractive about that person is that they're loving God with their heart and they're willing to put up with you, that, that, that probably is a good fit. And there's much more to say about that. That's pretty much my advice, though. Um, you can ask Pat for better advice. 
questions, comments? Uh, ultimately, I've given you the Augustinian ethic. Love God, do what you want. It's freedom from anxiety. It's freedom that I can make this significant decision in your life, but not significant in the kingdom of God, most likely, on where you go to school. As long as you're going to say, I'm going to pursue God there, I'm going to make God known there. Last chance for questions, comments, or complaints. So, say again. <laughs> what is my favorite scripture and why? Um, oh, man, I really want to be sarcastic here. Um, uh, Romans 8 is where I normally go. Romans 8 or, or Ephesians 1. Sorry, like the whole chapter. Uh, Ephesians 1. Sorry, you have mask on. Who asked that question? That's why, okay, that's what I thought. All right, I, you're like throwing your voice over here. And I, um, Ephesians 1, because I think it, it gives you the first tool to be a victorious Christian, and it's that God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In Christ, you have every spiritual blessing and the point he continues to follow then is that when you walk in Christ, you enjoy them. United with Christ, you have every blessing. Walking in Christ, you enjoy the blessing. We, we get confused with assurance and all kinds of things when we, when we confuse that. So I think Ephesians 1 is actually where I like to go most often in my own mind because I have to remember, no, that temptation is outside of my nature. That's not who I am anymore. I'm united with Christ. That guilt is not who I am anymore. I'm united with Christ. Yes, Nate. So, while it can be unhelpful to pursue promptings from God that, that are not promised, like if we want to answer to a question, like, well, if he was just giving me a sign, if he was, when really he's given us uh, his word to, to where we can discern Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul in his missionary journey, the Spirit stops him at certain times. Uh, I don't want to complete like a, uh, a complete open door theology with the, the door open, and then God wants you to walk through it. But it is, okay, it's back to Titus one: to the pure, all things are pure, but their mind uh, to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. There's a sense in which your conscience is supposed to be guiding you, and, and, and there's a sense in which your conscience is going to be properly informed by the spiritual truths. And there's the Holy Spirit who actually is the light. Uh, again, going back to 2 Peter 1, you will do well to, 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 to uh, focus in on the... Well, let me just read it instead of like butcher it and trying to paraphrase it. You will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. To the word of God and, and let the Holy Spirit guide you. Yes, Ruben. What is the difference between conscience and conscience? Every human being has a conscience. God has given every human being made in his image a conscience. Now, we see our conscience. The conscience is a moral center. Uh, it, it, it is a God-given uh, ability to do right and wrong, apart from even his law. Uh, the Holy Spirit is his God-given eyes, 
illuminating power to see his truth, believe his truth, and obey his truth. So the conscience is just part of being an image bearer. Uh, and as much as we can sear our conscience, we can quench the Holy Spirit. Was that question even experientially? Like, how do you tell the difference? Like, is this my conscience or the Holy Spirit? Uh, I know that's a harder, longer question, but yeah. that, <laughs> I would guess, yeah. It's a good, long question to, to ponder together. So, it is a good question. I'll, I'll say this, a conscience is a moral center that tells you right and wrong. It's typically your mother's voice. Um, it's my own. Um, the Holy Spirit, the difference there is the Holy Spirit points you to see Jesus more. Your conscience doesn't point you to Jesus. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus. That's a significant difference. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us alone to guess who you are or what you want from us. We thank you that you've given us a foundation to know that we can trust you. You've even told us how you reveal yourself to us. That it's complete, it's perfect, it's trustworthy, it's true. Help us, Lord, to not suppress it. Help us, Lord, to not find ways around it. Help us, Lord, to embrace it fully, trust you, and walk in your ways. In Jesus we pray. Amen.